Okay, uh, thank you, everyone. So uh, let's thank, uh, uh, let's welcome the second speaker of the session, Leo Zhou from Harvard, and uh, talking about strongly universal Hamiltonian simulators. This uh, joint work with Dorit Aronoff from H uh, Hebrew University. Please go ahead, Leo. Uh, thank you, Cheng Tao, uh, for the introduction. So uh, today I will talk about uh, uh, strongly universal Hamiltonian simulators. And this work is uh, as, uh, in the context of analog uh, quantum simulation, which is considered one of the most promising applications of quantum computers. Uh, why, you may ask? Well, you know, as said elegantly by Richard Feynman in, in the early 1980s, that uh, if you want to simulate nature, which is quantum mechanical, uh, it's much easier to do so with a quantum device and a, than a classical device. And furthermore, uh, Sirach and Zoller argued about 10 years ago that analog quantum simulation can be more robust against errors than digital quantum simulation uh, because, uh, because uh, the, the effect of noise uh, in, in analog simulators are sort of confined locally. And, and because of that, uh, they're considered more promising for near-term uh, quantum device than many of the digital uh, quantum algorithms. And, and in fact, there has also been a lot of experimental progress uh, in making analog simulators, and they're already being used to solve real world problems. Uh, as an example, uh, uh, some of you may know what uh, many body localization and time crystals are. They're actually uh, hypothetical phenomena originally proposed by physicists, and there actually has been a lot of debate on whether or not they uh, are actually real or simply artifacts from finite size numerical simulation. And recently, analog simulator, uh, simulators like the system of 50 trap ions uh, in Chris Monroe's group have provided strong evidence that these effects are, do, in fact, do in fact exist in the real world. As another example, uh, systems of uh, rearrangeable neutral atoms in optical tweezers have been used to probe quantum phase transitions. And recently, uh, coherent quantum phase transitions have been observed across systems as large as 250 atoms, which is almost an order of magnitude larger than the state-of-the-art digital quantum computer. Another important uh, proposed application uh, for analog simulators is qu quantum chemistry. And, and there's also been some recent progress using uh, superconductors to extract um, a vibrational spectra in molecules like ozone and, and water. Now on the theoretical front, uh, a very nice recent uh, progress has been made uh, by uh, Toby Cubitt, uh, Ashley Montanaro, and Stephen Pidock in, in showing that there actually exists some uh, families of Hamiltonian which are universal in the sense that they can simulate any uh, other, like all the other Hamiltonians. And, and they discovered that some very simple Hamiltonians like a uh, 2D spin lattice model uh, on a square lattice, for example, uh, can actually be used to simulate uh, Hamiltonians as complex as a long range interacting uh, many body localized system uh, or molecules or anything that you throw at it. For example, even the OTL connected uh, SYK model, which is have been used to uh, model uh, certain aspects of black holes. Well, this is a, you know, a very nice result because it says that if you can implement these uh, simple Hamiltonians, you can in principle use them to simulate uh, all the other Hamiltonians uh, uh, but, but one key missing uh, 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 study uh, is that we don't really know how the resources uh, should scale in, in principle. And in the original construction uh, by, by uh, Toby Cubitt and others, uh, what they showed is that if you have a, a 2D target Hamiltonian, such as a, a you know, honeycomb lattice or, or just any sort of uh, two-dimensional system, you can uh, indeed, in principle, uh, simulate them efficiently with a, a universal, uh, with a family that, uh, drawn from this universal family. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the number of particles in the in the Hamiltonian in the simulator only needs to scale polynomially. Uh, so does the interaction energy. But on the other hand, if you give me a, a target Hamiltonian that's uh, three-dimensional or worse, uh, all two are interacting, then the interaction energy in this uh, construction. Uh, it seems to need to seem to scale up uh, exponentially uh, in the system in the original target system sets. So because of that, uh, uh, we came up with a terminology called weakly universal to mean basically this uh, any family that is universal but but may require exponential resource uh, in in some case. So 
Well, our result is uh, to uh, is to uh, we show that actually there actually exist uh, very simple, strongly universal Hamiltonians uh, in the sense that uh, these families are universal uh, in the uh, that they can simulate all other Hamiltonians, but also all the resources are only scaling polynomially in the original target Hamiltonian system size for any target Hamiltonian. And this is in contrast to the exponential scaling for, for some of the target Hamiltonians uh, if you only have weak universality. So what this implies is that analog quantum simulation are realistic for not just simple systems, but, but general target systems. Uh, so if you give me you know, any Hamiltonian uh, in any dimension like 3D or RTR, you can efficiently encode them in some simple systems in uh, one or 2D. So for the rest of my talk, uh, I, I, I will start by defining uh, more precisely what I mean by Hamiltonian simulation and universality. And then I will review uh, previous constructions of universal Hamiltonians. Uh, and then I'll move on to uh, our construction of strongly universal Hamiltonians. I will sketch uh, some basic key idea behind our construction and provide some discussion. So I start by defining uh, what uh, Hamiltonian simulation is, and this is actually uh, been nicely formalized in these two work by Bravi Hastings and, and Kubi Montanaro and Pidoc. So what they propose is that, uh, you know, if you give me a target Hamiltonian H and you look at all of these eigenstates, uh, then we say H tilde simulates H, uh, if you can encode all of the eigenstates and eigenvalues of the original Hamiltonian as the low lying part of the spectrum, of the new Hamiltonian below some energy called up delta. And, and the encoding is done by some isometry. Uh, and more precisely, uh, uh, the, the new Hamiltonian H, when you restrict it to the eigenstates below the cutoff, has to be uh, epsilon close to the encoded uh, Hamilton, uh, original Hamiltonian uh, in the sense of uh, in, uh, in operator norm. And furthermore, we want the encoding to be approximately local in the sense that you can uh, roughly decompose it into uh, isometries that acts independently on the uh, different uh, particles of the original systems. And that's important because uh, we want to preserve a locality of observables and also locality of noise processes uh, so that uh, the analog simulation is, rob is robust. Now I need to uh, tell you what I mean by universality, and this is uh, done in the context of not a, not a single a Hamiltonian, but a family of Hamiltonians. So more specifically, we consider families of Hamiltonians of the following form. Uh, they're uh, defined on some uh, just two body interactions on some set of edges. And, and uh, there's a prefactor for each of the term that describes the interaction energy. And the operator H is a, is a, a two-body operator that acts on a side i and j with potentially some side-dependent parameter phi. And, and we say such a family is weak in universal. If you give me uh, any n-particle local Hamiltonian H, there exists a, a, a Hamiltonian H tilde in the family that simulates H in the sense that we de, uh, defined just earlier. And we say this family is strongly universal if the family is both uni weakly universal and all the resources uh, like energy and number of particles scales polynomially in the, the original uh, system, system, uh, system size as well as all the different precision parameters. Another useful concept uh, that we will define is uh, a, a translation invariance. Uh, and we say that a family of Hamiltonian is semi-translationally invariant if the uh, uh, operator that acts on pairs of size are the same no matter which two sides you're talking about. So, so the parameters uh, that you can in principle be site dependent is irrelevant. So this is an example of a semi-translation invariant Hamiltonian. And then we can you know, uh, take the uh, translation invariance a, a step further and, and, and define full translation invariance if uh, it's both semi-translation invariant and also the different interaction energy are the same for every pairs of size. So this is an example that has full translation invariance. So now with this definition in mind, uh, I will now describe uh, the, some previous constructions of universal Hamiltonians. So, uh, so the idea in the previous construction is as follows. Uh, if you take any uh, uh, local Hamiltonian, uh, it could be, for example, SYK model, uh, you can apply a, a, a series of encoders 
coding, such as uh, you know, uh, the different perturbative gadgets, and, and map it to a two-dimensional semi-translational invariant uh, uh, Hamiltonian on a 2D square lattice. And, and, and the basic key idea behind this is that uh, if you have a, a complicated Hamiltonian, you can uh, sort of map it to a finite dimensional lattice by using these gadgets uh, to do degree reduction. So, 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 so for example, if you have an SYK model, uh, you know, uh, each, of the, each of the particle talks to all the other particles, so the degrees are order n, uh, and that's, you know, on its own cannot be really embedded on a finite dimensional lattice. But if you apply a gadget such as this, uh, you can essentially half the degree every time you apply the, the, the gadget. And because of the fact that, you know, in principle, you could have order n degree, uh, you need to apply this gadget log n number of rounds. And each round, the interaction energy blows up polynomially. And, and in general, as you can see, if you, since you need to apply this log n number of times, uh, the final interaction energy scales uh, exponentially in the original system size. In contrast, uh, our result uh, shows that uh, these two-dimensional uh, semi-translational invariant families can actually be made uh, strongly universal. And, and in fact, you can even restrict it to simple, simple system like uh, XY interaction on a 2D square lattice or the Heisenberg interaction. And we can take this a step further and show that even uh, one-dimensional Hamiltonians uh, that only has nearest neighbor interaction uh, on a line of A-dimensional particles. So this A-dimension refers to the internal uh, dimensions of each particles. Uh, so even this simple family can be made strongly universal in the sense that they can efficiently simulate all other uh, Hamiltonians. And, and the form of the Hamiltonian uh, is, uh, is, is of the following, where the nearest neighbor term enforces uh, some sort of transition rules between different configurations. And because of the fact that the transition rules can be site dependent, there's no uh, any sort of sense of translation variance uh, in this case. And uh, we can compare our result to, to previous results. Uh, so starting from the original work by Kubi, Montanaro, and Pidog, there actually has been a, a flurry of work uh, showing uh, universality of various uh, Hamiltonians with different parameters. So there have been uh, uh, constructions of not just 2D, but also one-dimensional uh, system that are universal. Uh, some of them not only possessing semi-translational inva invariance, but also full translation invariance. But all of them require interaction energy that scales exponentially in the original system size. Uh, in contrast, uh, our construction is able to give uh, a simulated simulation that requires only polynomial interaction and also polynomial number of particles. So these are strongly universal. And I would uh, like to just provide a couple of remarks. First of all, uh, uh, you might wonder whether or not it's possible to bring this interaction energy down even further. But, but it's actually uh, not possible, and, and our results are tight in this sense, because uh, there's, there's actually an impossibility results showing that if you have a general Hamiltonian, it's, it's actually uh, not always possible to simulate it with uh, constant interaction energy uh, and constant degree. So if you restrict to a, to a finite dimensional lattice, which necessarily have constant degree, uh, it's impossible to do so with constant energy. Another, th another thing to notice is that the, the, actual, the fact that there exists a fully translation in, a invariant uh, uh, a universal Hamiltonian implies that uh, uh, weakly universal Hamiltonians are not always strongly universal. Uh, and this is, uh, can be seen in the following argument. Uh, so, so if you have full translation invariance, the only uh, free parameter of your Hamiltonian is just number of particles. And, and that basically means that you need exponential number of particles in order to encode general Hamiltonians, which are described by polynomial number of bits. So, so it's impossible to, for them to be efficient, at least in a particle number. But if you sort of relax the constraint of, of translational invariance so that maybe you know, there's, you know, every, every pairs of interaction looks the same, but maybe there's some parameter uh, for different target Hamiltonian, then you can maybe get around that uh, so that the particle number doesn't need to scale uh, exponentially. Uh, but, but but the fact that you know uh, there do exist, you know, this completely uh, translational invariant families that are weakly universal but cannot be strongly universal uh, means that these two notions are actually uh, distinct. Now, for Leo, the rest there are, of my Leo, there are a few questions from the Slack channel. So, yeah. um, uh, Itai Li is asking uh, for translation environment. 
is there um, any demand for the underlying graph uh, to be trans translationally environment or do we just consider the land? Um, so we didn't really uh, consider the case where the graph is not translational invariant. Uh, I guess uh, that could be also interesting. So that, that would mean that we, we would need to relax the, the definition of translation invariance a bit further. Uh, but in, in all of the construction that here with any form of translation invariance, they are uh, set on some kind of lattice. Okay. And the, uh, the question from Norbert Shuk, um, what about no, not constant energy, but for example, log n energy? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I guess that, that that's definitely open. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, uh, but my, my personal guess is that it, it's, it probably wouldn't work either. Uh, uh, I think that if you uh, go to the impossibility result, and I, I think if you, uh, mm, uh, if you, there's maybe a way to tweak the impossibility proof to, to show impossibility for login, uh, but I, I am not sure. Andrew Childs is asking, you mentioned that you cannot do general simulation with constant interaction energy and constant degree, but pre pre uh, presumably you can still do something interesting simulations. Um, can you characterize what is possible? Uh, so that's definitely a, a question that we, uh, we want to pursue, but currently uh, the impossibility is only for the worst case. So, so I think that there are, there are examples uh, maybe uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, for some, Typical Hamiltonians uh, uh, drawn from some family, you know, you can maybe simulate it with uh, constant interaction and energy and constant degree. But I think that you know, it the the whole landscape is not well understood, and I think that's definitely a, a question that the community uh, sh uh, should pursue further. Yeah, and there's a follow up question uh, from Norbert. So, uh, how bad are the polynomials? <laughs> so, so currently, they're, they're, uh, you know, the constructions are, are, are done in a very inefficient way. We just want to show that it's possible with some, some you know, power of the polynomial. Uh, I think maybe, you know, I think it's like maybe n to the 20, perhaps. Uh, so, but we were not very careful in the analysis. I think that that's definitely one of the, uh, the, the thing. Actually, I put that in the open questions later that, you know, can we try to improve these constructions so that they can be more experimentally relevant? Yeah, thanks. Please go ahead. Thank you for, for the excellent questions. So, so for the rest of my talk, I would just like to you know, tell you a bit about the key ideas behind our construction. So, so a key issue, as I mentioned before, is that, uh, that uh, in order to map general Hamiltonians to, to a simple finite dimensional lattice, uh, uh, a key problem is this de degree reduction. And, and previously, a degree reduction has been done mostly with just perturbative gadgets. And as I mentioned before, uh, they require in general exponential uh, energy. And we also showed that degree reduction with constant energy is impossible. But that leaves open the possibility that, uh, you know, you can potentially degree reduce with polynomial energy. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, we, we do give a constructive way to do this. And this is done via circuits. So what I mean by uh, degree reduction via circuit is the following. So, so if you give me any uh, Hamiltonian, it could be RTO interacting, doesn't matter. Uh, I can write it as uh, you know, a sum over the different eigenstates. And, and then you can kind of consider a, a, a quantum phase estimation circuit running on this Hamiltonian. And, and, and what that does is that if you give me any eigenstate uh, of the Hamiltonian, uh, then you will basically write down the energy eigenvalue as a bit string on, um, Part of the ancilla, and and as you uh, as you can see, you know, once you uh, there's sort of a you can see there's kind of an equivalence between this Hamiltonian and this circuit, and and once you convert this Hamiltonian into a circuit, it's actually very easy to, to perform de degree reduction, and that's because you know if you give me any circuit, uh, you can you know make sure that each qubit is only acted on by a constant number of gates by simply adding ancilla and swap gates, like like follows, and and. Basically, you know, once you you know apply any gate and you swap it to the to the some new new fresh ancillas, you can just make sure that the uh, the original uh, you know these original qubits are no longer touched uh, for the rest of the computation, and that's why they're only acted on by a constant number of gates. And once you sort of have this uh, degree reduced circuit, you can map it back to a Hamiltonian uh, that's also have a constant degree using uh, you know some version of the Feynman key type clock Hamiltonian construction. Now another key idea uh, is that you know uh, uh, normally in, in, in the Feynman-Kitayev uh, uh, 
a clock Hamiltonian construction, uh, what you do is you isolate uh, the valid computational uh, states uh, as the ground space of some circuit Hamiltonia, but you still need to recover uh, the, the different eigenvalue structure of the, uh, of the uh, different eigenstates. And, and this is why you know, uh, this uh, phase estimation uh, comes into place because uh, you know, once the energy eigenvalue is written down as a bit string on the ancilla, you can simply uh, apply a, a, a penalty Hamiltonian uh, a bit by bit once the, the clock is correspond to you know, the, the end of the computational circuit. Uh, and this allows you to recover all the different eigenvalues that correspond to different eigenstates. And now uh, uh, with these two key ideas, I will just uh, sketch the structure of our proof. Uh, so if you give me any uh, local Hamiltonian, you can you know, map it to a phase estimation circuit using nearest neighbor uh, on a 1D line of qubits you know, using very standard techniques. And then uh, once you have this 1D circuit, you can make sure that you know, each qubit is only acted on by a constant number of gates using this uh, non-perturbative degree reduction idea that we mentioned. Uh, and also, uh, you know, recover the different eigenvalues of the different eigenstates using this bitwise energy penalty. And that will give you a two-dimensional spatially sparse Hamiltonian, uh, because, uh, for example, you can make this circuit uh, 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 into, map this circuit into sort of a, a grid of qubits, and you have the original qubits in the, in the first column, and you just swap it to the next column whenever you, uh, after you apply every single gate. And this gives you sort of a two-dimensional uh, uh, arrangement of the, uh, the circuit where all the uh, gates are applied locally and each qubit is only acted on by a constant number of gates. Now to map it uh, to uh, a two-dimensional uh, square lattice Hamiltonian, we use the known gadgets uh, uh, that was developed. Uh, for example, it turns out that you can encode qubits using Heisenberg, Heisenberg interaction uh, by taking each qubit and map it to uh, a four different uh, qubits arranged in this sort of triangle way. And, and then you can also embed these sort of gadgets on a 2D lattice uh, using uh, something like this. And that gives you a two-dimensional Hamiltonian that has semi-translational invariance using only say Heisenberg or XY interaction uh, that's embedded on a square lattice. And if you wanna go to 1D, what we can do is that you can take the uh, known uh, construction of 1D uh, QMA complete Hamiltonians, which uses uh, 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 eight, eight dimensional particles that stores both the computational states and also some marker states. Uh, and this was you know, done as early as uh, 2007. And I think the best uh, uh, construction, uh, as far as I know, is the, the 2013 uh, construction by Helgren, the guy, uh, and uh, Nara Young Swami. And this allows you to construct a 1D nearest neighbor Hamiltonian uh, that simulates all the uh, a local Hamiltonian uh, uh, by combining this construction with the, the other ideas with the energy penalty that we have. So in summary, uh, we've established that strongly universal analog quantum simulation is possible. Uh, we can efficiently simulate uh, any target Hamiltonian, not just the ones with the same spatial dimensionality. And in fact, some, some simple system like 1D and uni, uh, 2D uh, universe uh, systems are universal uh, 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 and they only require poly and uh, qubits and interaction energy. Uh, and, and we believe that this result is uh, uh, basically tight because uh, uh, of the impossibility result that we had earlier that shows that it's impossible to lower the interaction energy to a constant. Uh, and this basically implies that analog quantum simulation is relevant for many more systems than maybe what that was previously thought. And some open questions that I think that was already brought up before is that, uh, can we you know, improve the constructions in some way? Uh, uh, you know, can we make a one dimensional semi-translation Averian uh, uh, Hamiltonian that's also uh, strongly universal? Is it even possible to have a fully translational invariant Hamiltonian that's strongly universal? And, and can we you know, move beyond just qubits? Can we think about you know, using fermions to simulate uh, all other systems? And can we also you know, improve the overhead that, which is currently polynomial, but as uh, Norbert brought up, you know, uh, you know, I think our construction is not very careful in making the, uh, the parameters efficient. And can we make it improve them so much that they can actually be experimentally relevant? And another very key question, I think that uh, that people have started to address, but uh, but is uh, definitely uh, need a, a lot of future work is: can we understand the effects of noise uh, in this analog simulation a bit better? And and that's that's all. And I, I am happy to take uh, any more additional questions.
Thank you, Leo, for the very nice talk. Uh, let's see if there's any questions from the Slack channel. Okay. Um, Abinav, Abinav Dash Hand is, is asking, the Hamiltonians you considered were all to all, but essentially k local for some constant k, right? Can this be improved for k scaling with n? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, 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 currently we, uh, our techniques, uh, uh, I think, uh, don't directly work if you have uh, like order and local uh, Hamiltonians. Um, but I think, uh, you know, uh, often the, the high, high local uh, locality of the Hamiltonians arises from, you know, uh, like uh, inefficiency in the mapping between fermions and, and spins, for example. So I think that, uh, you know, if you can develop uh, universal simulators with fermions, uh, then you don't really need to worry about this order and locality. Uh, um, but, uh, but, the, but maybe there's also, you know, uh, a new techniques to be discovered to maybe reduce the locality uh, to constant, similar to how uh, we are able to re reduce the degree from order n to, to, to a constant. And Andreas Gideon is asking, did you say that fully translational environment, strongly universal is impossible due to information theoretic arguments? Uh, yeah, so maybe I kind of uh, skim over that a bit quick too quickly. So, so there's sort of slightly, uh, you know, different notions of fully translational invariance. If you require like the very strict version, where the only free parameter is just a system size, then yeah, in, in that case, uh, it's impossible. But you can also consider a situation where uh, you have the system size as a free parameter, but also maybe you know every two particle interaction. Uh, could change depending on what your target Hamiltonian is. So, so in which case, you know, uh, all the interactions still look the same in the system, uh, but you know, but the system might change, uh, but the interaction might change, you know, depending on the uh, what your target system is. So, so in, in that case, uh, you know, uh, I think in a, in a recent work by uh, Tamara Colin and others, uh, they show that you know, with this sort of relaxation, you're able to bring down the number of particles from exponential to polynomial. But it's still open question whether or not you can bring the interaction energy from exponential to polynomial in, in that situation. Yeah, and there's a um, follow up question by Abhinav. So I'm asking, how about case going like log n? Uh, uh, I think in that, in that case, yes, I think you can apply our technique. You just need to kind of massage the, 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 the proof a little bit. I'm, I'm pretty sure in that case, you can also make it polynomial. I, I think uh, one intuition is perhaps, uh, 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 so, so one of the things that we, we use is that you can kind of, uh, you know, take uh, any, uh, D-dimensional unitaries and converted to two cubic two, two, big, two cubic gates, you know, using Solovey Kitaya. So if you have a, a log n local uh, uh, sort of uh, interaction that kind of correspond to a gate that's acting on, you know, a log n qubit, that's like, you know, the dimension that that Hilbert space is roughly, you know, polynomial, and and I think that you can convert it to a polynomial number of two cubic gates, and that basically allows you to do this uh, reduction to only two two body interactions. Yeah, if, if there are no questions, let's thank Leo again.